Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this UK data service webinar named an introduction to machine learning. My name is Nadia Kenner and I'm a research associate based at the University of Manchester with the Cathy Marsh Institute. So a little rundown of what to expect in the three part workshop series that we have. So this session we're going to be looking at an overview of machine learning, we're going to look at looking at some definitions to what exactly is a machine learning, looking at what a model is and the difference between an algorithm. We'll then move on to look at different machine learning methods and discuss how machine learning is different from classical like statistics. And uh, then we'll introduce a case study, case study where we work through the seven steps to machine learning. In session two, which is uh, will be run by Louise on the 26th of October, we'll be looking specifically at um, an unsupervised method known as clustering. And she'll take you through two different approaches. That is the central based approach and then the hierarchical based approach. In our third session, which will be next week, November 2nd, we'll be doing a live code demonstration and we'll be using a data set to explore some of these different clustering methods that we discussed. The first hour will be in Python and then the second hour will be in R. Um, so feel free to join at any time that suits your preferred programming language. Okay, so now we can get started. Um, what exactly is machine learning? Well, machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence that allows for software applications to become more accurate at predicting outcomes without being explicit, explicitly programmed to do so. In, in more of a layman's terms, this is the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. Typically, artificial intelligence and machine learning are seen as synonymous. And this is because most of the current advances in AI involve some sort of machine learning. Um, it was defined in 1950s by an AI pioneer named Arthur, Arthur Samuel. He described this as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without explicitly being programmed to do so. See, this definition still holds true today. Machine learning takes the approach of letting computers learn to program themselves through experience. This means that machines can recognize a visual scene, understand a text written in natural language, or perform an action in the physical world. Um, machine learning is behind chatbots, it's, it's behind predictive text, it's behind language translation apps, the shows that Netflix suggests to you, and how your social media's uh, feeds are presented. In order to understand exactly what machine learning is, we can explore some of its functions. <clears throat> I would say that there are three main parts to a machine learning system. The first is the descriptive. This uses the data to explain what happened in the past. So this may start with um, either numbers, photos, text, time series data, and then this data is gathered and prepared to be used as a training data um, all the information the machine learning model will be trained on. So this descriptive analysis looks at data statistically to tell you what happened in the past. This um, descriptive function is very fundamental machine learning as it allows you to explore the variables and attributes within your data set. Um, the next function is known as the predictive analysis. This is this, where the system uses the data to predict what will happen in the future. Um, programmers choose a machine, a machine learning model to use, supply their data, and let the computer model train itself to find patterns or make predictions. We then move on to the third function, which is known as the prescriptive ana analysis. So this system will use the data to make suggestions about what action to take. Prescriptive analysis kind of um, takes predictive ana analysis to, to the next level. It basically asks, like now that you have an idea of what will likely happen in the future what should you do and it suggests various courses of actions and outlines what the potential implications would be for each it's um, interesting to note that the output of a machine learning system is a model that can be thought of as an algorithm for future computations the more data the system is presented with the more refined the model will be and the quality of the learned model is also dependent on um, on the quality of the data used to train it. So if the data is biased, for example, then the output of the model will also be biased. But we'll discuss this a little uh, later. 
So why is machine learning important? There is a lot of data in the world generated not only by people, but now also by computers, phones, and other devices. Traditionally, humans have analyzed data and adaptive, adapted systems to the changes in data patterns. However, the volume of data has grown so large that the ability for humans to make sense of this data is incredibly hard. So this is where we turn increasingly to automated systems. These automated systems can learn from the data, but also um, they adapt to like the, the shifting landscape. So they change over time. Um, there are also multiple uh, uses that machine learning can be applied to in order to do things for businesses like cut costs, mitigate risks, and generally just improve the overall quality of life. Um, with greater access to data and computational power, machine learning is becoming more important every day and will soon be integrated into, into many facets of human life. We can have a look at some applications that machine learning um, has. One, the first example is image recognition. Image recognition is the process of identifying an object or a feature in an image or a video. Image recognition has helped the healthcare industry vastly by improving diagnosing diseases like, um, like cancer with greater accuracy. Another application of machine learning that we see quite regularly is fraud detection. Fraud detection, um, basically through the analysis of images of like banknotes, machine learning algorithms detect patterns in financial operations and decide whether a given transaction is legitimate. Um, another application that I find really interesting is uh, recommendation systems. So things like YouTube, social media, um, your Netflix account, these machine learning algorithms basically segment like customers based on their user data and behavioral patterns. So things like what you purchase, your browsing history, your likes or your reviews, and then targeted them with personalized products and content suggestions. Um, another application is text to speech systems, which can be used to improve accessibility for those with, with hearing impairments, disabilities, or, or age citizens. Um, text to speech systems also have a, has another name known as uh, speech synthesis. So using a variation of machine learning called deep neural networks, which we won't discuss today, uh, but we can use deep neural networks to basically produce artificial speech from text. Uh, yeah, so these are just a few machine learning applications. And through these, through applying descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive analytics, we've been able to apply these methods to other ranges, to, to other fields such as uh, transportation or retail. So we can move on to have a look and discuss how machine learning is different to classical statistics. Before moving on to discuss the methods of machine learning, I think it's important to elaborate how machine learning is different, but also similar to classical statistics. So I've summarized what I think are the important distinctions. Looking at the approach from the machine learning perspective, the focus is on limiting assumptions. However, in statistics, these assumptions are made from algorithmic models, also known as uh, statistical modeling. So, Statistical modeling refers to the data science process of applying statistical analysis to data sets. A statistical model typically is a mathematical relationship between one or more random variables and other non-random variables. So the application of statistical modeling to raw data helps data scientists approach uh, data analysis in a, in a more strategic manner by providing like visualizations that aid in identifying the relationships between these variables and making predictions. On the other hand, machine learning programs need large amounts of data and proper insights in order to function. They use this data to then build their models. This moves on to the focus. In, in a machine learning approach, 
we basically try to, to limit the assumptions to a minimum and it will let the data almost speak for itself. Statistics, however, usually requires the statistician to make assumptions about the structure and or the distribution of the data, trying to guess the relationship between the variables in order to write an appropriate model. The last um, difference, which I think is, is quite crucial, would be between the inference. Machine learning models are designed to make the most accurate predictions possible, whereas statistical models are designed for inference about the relationship between variables. So yes, a main difference between machine learning and statistics is indeed their purpose. However, saying machine learning is all about accurate predictions, whereas statistical models are designed for inference, can be argued to be a bit of a limited statement. And this is because there, are different, there is a difference between comparing statistics and then comparing statistical models. So yes, we can still examine the parameters of machine learning, and yes, we can still focus on the predictions and statistics. So the inference would be dependent on your approach as a researcher. It'd be dependent on the research questions that you have asked, your goals, your aims. And this kind of brings us on nicely to the overlap. It brings us onto this gray area between, between the two. Uh, personally, myself, I would not put a label on every single algorithm to fit within machine learning or to fit within statistics because they are deeply intertwined and use many, many of the same tools, such as the computational techniques that, that, um, that I've mentioned. So in the end, when you're in the gray area between the two, the fact of doing statistics or doing machine learning often depends on the mentality that you use when approaching the problem. We can um, explore this gray area by looking at an example of a machine learning, a machine learning method known as regression. <clears throat> through a statistical lens, through a statistical lens um, with regression, you would typically examine the variables and based on the meaning, try to understand which ones might interact, which ones have some, some sort of linear dependency, and then build the model. However, through a machine learning lens, you might use a backwards like elimination process of features starting from a model containing every interaction. So this is letting the data decide which ones are relevant. So regression uh, proves to be an example of both a machine learning method as well as a statistical method, because it uses not only the same computational powers, uh, uses the same skills, and also has this fundamental understanding of, um, of regression in itself. But this um, moves us on to discuss some of the machine learning methods in a bit more detail. In general, most machine learning techniques can be classified into supervised learning and unsupervised learning. In supervised machine learning, the algorithm is provided an input data set and then is rewarded or optimized to meet a set of specific outputs. For example, supervised machine learning is widely deployed in image recognition, which was mentioned earlier, and it utilizes a, a technique called classification. Compared to unsupervised machine learning, the algorithm is provided an input data set, but not rewarded or optimized to specific outputs, and instead trained to a group of objects by common characteristics. One example could be um, recommendation systems or recommendation engines, also mentioned earlier. And this is typically done using a technique called, called clustering. But we can expand on this a little bit further, but I think it's first important to discuss the differences between models and algorithms because I have used uh, both terms quite frequently in, in the last 15 minutes in itself. An algorithm is a in, in an algorithm in machine learning is a procedure that is run on data to correct a machine learning model. Machine learning algorithms are procedures that are implemented in code and are run on data. Machine learning models, on the other hand, are outputs by algorithms and are comprised of model data and prediction algorithms. So algorithms typically tend to come before the model. 
Moreover, a uh, machine learning model is a program that can find patterns or make decisions from previously unseen data. So again, for example, in image recognition, a machine learning model can be taught to recognize objects, whether this be cars or dogs, and then the machine learning model can perform such tasks by having it trained with a large data set. During this training, the machine learning, learning algorithm is optimized to find certain patterns or outputs from the data set, depending on the task. The output of this process, um, after a, so the, yeah, the output of this process is named a machine learning model. So how exactly does a machine learning algorithm work? There are um, three really important functions to a machine le learning algorithm. The first step is the decision process. This is the steps that take in the data and guess what kind of patterns your algorithm is looking to find. In general, machine learning algorithms, as discussed, are used to make predictions or classifications. So based on some input data, which can be labeled or unlabeled, your algorithm will produce an estimate about a pattern in the data. The um, second function to a machine learning algorithm is the loss slash error function. So this measures how good the guess was by comparing it to other examples. An error function basically serves to evaluate the prediction of the model. So if there are known examples, an error function can make a comparison to assess the accuracy of the model. The last function is the model optimization process. And this is simply a method in which the algorithm looks at the miss or the error and then updates the decision process. So basically, if the model can fit better to the data points in the training set, uh, then weights are adjusted to reduce the discrepancy between the known examples and the model estimates. This algorithm will repeat itself and repeat the evaluation and the optimization process until an accurate um, threshold has been met. Just a little bit more about models and their implications. Um, learning models are established based on data driven principles. So a typical process is to learn uh, slash discover generic patterns based on a training data set. And it's important to know that machine learning works in an inductive learning manner by uh, just, yeah, in an inductive learning manner. This means that it learns slash discovers a generic rule from a number of examples generated by such a rule. And the nature of machine learning always limits the training data to only a specific sample of a population to be modeled. The most important fact here to know is that the ultimate goal of machine learning is towards inductive bias or general generalization. So a learning model can predict output correctly given input that have not been encountered during learning. In other words, a learning model should be able to generalize the rule learned from observed data to the unseen data. So uh, we can move on now to discuss the differences between supervised learning and unsupervised learning a little bit better. So what is supervised learning? Well, we can understand what this means by looking directly at the words that make it up. Supervised to, means to observe and direct the execution of a task or an activity. And using this definition, we will be supervising a machine learning model that might be able to produce classifications. But how do we, how do we supervise a machine learning model? We do this by teaching the model. We load the model with knowledge, with knowledge and then have it predict future instances. So how, how do we teach this model? In short, we can teach a model by training it with a labeled data set. Supervised machine learning algorithms functions with data that is already labeled. Each sample is, um, typically tagged with one or like several labels according to the category of objects. And then corresponds to specific characteristics and properties which allow the identification and classification of objects. 
Now, according to the labeled data, the system is learning from, it will be able to use this piece of information to identify and classify new images. Uh, the example on the slide is from a data set called IRIS, which is, you may or may not be familiar with, but it's a very, very common data set used for machine learning and statistics. So there's another overlap. Um, but I think it's important just to talk about some of the components because there are overlaps in um, the names of these variables. So if you look at the rows, we have the sepal length, the sepal width, the petal length, the petal width, and the class. So these, these names are its attributes. These are also known as its variables. However, if we look down the columns, that this includes the data and are typically known as features. These are also known as your values. Um, well, I thought it was just useful just to provide a bit of context to the overlaps in names. <clears throat> so there are two types of supervised learning. We have regression and classification. Now, a regression algorithm can predict a discrete value, which is in the form of an integer, whereas a classification algorithm can predict a continuous value if it is in the form of a class label. So class classification in itself is a predictive model that approximate approximates a mapping function from input variables to identify discrete output variables, which can be labels or categories. So an example from the IRIS data set might be that you, you're attempting to predict class against, for example, sepal width. Compared to regression, now regression algorithms tend to predict a continuous value based on the input variables. The main goal of regression problem is to estimate a mapping function based on the input and output variables. Um, so yeah, if your target variable is, is a quantity like income, uh, scores, height, or width, or if the probability of a binary character, then you should use a regression model. There are some, here are some supervised algorithm examples followed in the classification and regression. In classification, some examples of the algorithms include a decision tree, random forecast, or a k-nearest um, neighbor. A decision tree is, in, in this algorithm, a classification model basically is created by building a decision tree where every node of the tree is a test case for an attribute, and each branch coming from the node is a possible value for that attribute. We then have a random forest, so this is a little bit different. And this is a tree-based algorithm and it includes a set of decision trees which are randomly selected from a subset of the main training set. Uh, we then have k-nearest neighbor, which is another example of an algorithm in the supervised learning. And this basically assumes that similar things exist in close proximity to each other. We then have some example algorithms from regression. So this is, includes simple, multiple and polynomial regression. Uh, typically, this is where we estimate the relationship between one independent variable and another dependent variable or multiple dependent variables if you're using multiple linear regression. But yeah, these are just some examples of algorithms in the supervised learning. These do not include um, all possible algorithms. So now we can move on to understanding um, what is unsupervised learning. In short, we do not supervise the model, but instead let the model work on its own to discover information that may not be visible. Unsupervised learning uses machine learning algorithms that draw conclusions on unlabeled data set. So this is the opposite to supervised that uses labeled. Unsupervised learning is said to be more complex because we have little to no information about the data or the outcomes to be expected. Unsupervised learning has uh, fewer tests and fewer models that can be used to make sure the outcome of the model is accurate. Therefore, we have less um, of a controllable output. Compared to supervised learning, unsupervised classification or clustering algorithms attempt to discover structure in data by organizing into groups whose members are similar to each other. The raw data set being used in the unlabeled 
and then the algorithm identifies the patterns and relationships within the data without help from the user. Um, here in unsupervised learning, there are there are three there are three subfields that is clustering, association, and dimensionality reduction. Now, clustering involves the analysis of patterns and groupings of unlabeled data, as previously discussed. We then have an association. So an association rule is basically a, um, it's a rule-based method for finding relationships between variables in a given data set. So these methods are frequently used for uh, market, market analysis, and they allow for companies to better understand the relationships between different products, for example. And then we have dimensionality reduction, and it is a technique used when the number of features or dimensions in a given data set is too high. So it reduces the number of data inputs to a manageable size by also preserving the integrity of the data sets as much as possible. It's uh, typically commonly used in pre-processing data stage, and there are a few different uh, dimensionality reduction methods that can be used as seen on the screen, but we're not gonna discuss too much about these algorithms as they can uh, be a little bit complicated, but we'll be discussing some of these in the later sessions um, this week and next week. Uh, just for some reference, there are also some other machine learning methods that move from supervised and unsupervised. So we have uh, semi-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, and deep learning methods. Semi-supervised learning refers to a learning problem that involves a small portion of labeled examples and a large number of unlabeled examples from which a model must learn and make predictions. Um, so if you, it kind of falls between, it falls between the two. We then have reinforcement learning, and this happens when the algorithm interacts continually with the environment rather than relying on training data. One of the most popular examples of reinforcement learning would be um, autonomous driving. We then have deep learning, which was briefly discussed, but this is a this is a newer area of machine learning that automatically learns from data sets without introducing human rules or knowledge. So this requires massive amounts of raw data for processing. And the more data that is received, the more the predictive model improves. Um, but as of recent, supervised and unsupervised learning methods make up a lot of the applications that we see day to day. Um, so yeah, now we've discussed the, the big definitions and the big questions surrounding machine learning. I think it's important to then discuss some of the steps of machine learning. And this was discussed by Yu Feng in 2017. So he, uh, they described that there were seven steps to machine learning. This involves collecting your data, data preparation, choosing a model, training, evaluation, parameter tuning, and then prediction. And um, in order to understand these steps, I've come up with a case study that allows us to create our own model. So I'm going to be talking through a case study and um, explaining how each step applies to our case study. So let's just say that we have been asked to create a system that answers the question of whether a food item can be classed as an apple or as an orange. Now, this might be a really simple question, but this will help us to understand um, how we can go about choosing a model and how we can go about training our data set. So this question answering system that we build is, is called a model. And this model is created by a process called training. The goal of training is to create an accurate model that answers our questions correctly most of the time. But in order to train a model, we need to collect the data to train on. And this is where we begin. Step one is to gather the data. Um, for the purpose of developing my machine learning model, our first step would be to gather relevant data that can be used to differentiate the two fruits. Uh, you can use different parameters to classify a fruit as either an orange or an apple, but for the sake of simplicity, I've taken uh, two features. 
the first being the colour and the second being the shape. So using these features, we would hope that our model can accurately differentiate between the two fruits. Now, typically you might have a model that includes way more features, but um, yeah, we'll be just using two features for today. So the data that we have collected here, the data that you see on the screen would be your training data set. So we can then move on to step two, which involves preparing your data. So once you have gathered the data, um, we then move on to the data pre-processing stage. And typically this does uh, involve the biggest step. This can, this can take up, the, this is the most time consuming step depending on the complexity of your data set. A key focus of this stage is to recognize and minimize any potential biases in our data sets for the two features. So typically the first step you would want to do is randomize the order of your data for the two fruits. And this is because we do not want the order to have any bearings on the model's choices. Furthermore, we would examine our data sets for any skewness towards a particular fruit. Uh, this again would help in identifying any potential biases, as it would mean that the model would be adapt at identifying one fruit correctly, but may struggle with the other fruit. Another major component of data preparation is breaking down the data sets into two parts. We have the larger part, which typically is around rough, is around 80% roughly, and this would be used for training the model while the smaller part, typically 20%, is used for evaluation process. Yeah, so this could be 80 to 20%, it could also be 70 to 30%, but this would al always depend on um, your aims as a researcher. Uh, this is important because using the same data sets for training and evaluation would not give a fair assessment of the model's performance in uh, real world scenarios. Apart from the data split, there could be additional steps taken to refine the data sets. Uh, this would be dependent on what type of data, data you have, but this in, could include removing, for example, duplicate entries or discarding for incorrect readings or removing missing values. But luckily we have a very simple data set, so there's not much that we need to do. Now, step three would um, involve choosing a model. Now, there are various existing models developed by data scientists which can be used for different purposes, but these models are designed with different goals in mind. For instance, some models are more suited to like dealing with texts, while other models may be better equipped to handle images. But with regards to our model, I think that a simple linear regression would um, be suitable in differentiating between our two fruits. So in our case, the type of fruit would be our dependent variable, while the color of the fruit and the shape of the fruit would be the two predictors or the independent variables. So this means that our features um, represent our independent variables. And just to recap, linear regression model, the, the linear regression model chosen here is an example of supervised learning. And this is because the outcome is known so we can continuously refine the model itself until our output reaches the desired accuracy level. So now we can go on to step four which involves training. So here we use the part of the data set allocated for training to teach our model to differentiate between the two fruits. If we view our model in mathematical terms, which you can see the equation on the top right of the screen, then the inputs so our two features would represent the coefficients or would have coefficients, apologies. And then these coefficients are called the weights of features. However, it's not too important to discuss the, the mathematics behind a regression model. So once you have um, taught your model to differentiate between the two fruits, we would then have to take a step back and do some evaluation. And this is where we draw our attention back to the functions of um, an algorithm. And this looks at the decision process, the loss error, and the model optimization. This is where we would have to reevaluate our model and ensure that the decisions taken at the start 
um, yeah, that the decisions taken at the start have the highest like optimization. We then can move on to our step five, which is the evaluation. And this is a very important step as well. So with the model trained, it needs to be tested to see if we can operate well in real world situations. And that is why the part of this data set created for evaluation is used to check for the model's proficiency. So this puts the model in a scenario where it encounters situations that were not part of its training. So in our case, it could mean trying to identify a type of apple or orange that is completely new to the model. For example, we never identified green apples in our original data set, and this might need to be included in order to um, improve the model's efficiency. This also leads us on to our next step, which is the parameter tuning. So if the evaluation is successful, then we proceed to the step of hyperparameter tuning. So this step basically tries to improve upon the positive results achieved during the evaluation step. For our example, we would see if we can make a model even better at recognizing apples and oranges. Um, and there are two ways we can go about improving the model. Firstly, you could revisit the training steps and use multiple sweeps of the training data set for training the model. This is because it could lead to greater accuracy as the longer duration of training provides more exposure and can improve the quality of the model. Another way to go about this is mm -hmm. to refine the initial values given to the models. Random initial values often produce poor results as they are gradually um, refined by trial and error. Trial and error. However, we, however, if we can go up with better initial values, or perhaps initiate the model using like a distribution instead of a value, then our results could get better. I think it's also important to note that there is not a definitive approach for parameter tuning, as it would depend on the learning approach you choose, but also what type of variables you have present. And this leads us to our last step, which is prediction, which is what I've been um, honing in at for, for this whole talk. But yes, the final step of the machine learning process is prediction. This is the stage where we consider the model to be ready for practical applications. So our fruit model should now be able to answer the question whether the given fruit is an apple or an orange. Um, it's kind of interesting to know that a model like this would gain independence from human inference and draws on its own conclusions on the basis of the data sets and the training. Um, <clears throat> I guess one thing to think about, um, so the challenge for this model remains whether it could outperform or at least match human, human judgment in different relevant scenarios. Um, but yes, I hope those seven steps have been able to provide some more context about how to run your own machine learning models and hopefully you'll be able to apply this to your own work. So let's have a, just a quick recap about the differences between supervised and unsupervised learning. As discussed, uh, supervised learning learns from the training data set by making predictions on the data and adjusting for the correct answer. Supervised techniques deal with labeled data, whereas unsupervised data uh, deals with unlabeled. The goals of supervised learning is well known before the training sets. So the type of output the model is expecting is already known. We just need to predict it for unseen new data. Um, with an unsupervised learning algorithm, the goal is to get insights from large volumes of new data, and there is no particular output value we're expecting to be predicted, which makes the whole training procedure more complex. In terms of its like applications, supervised learning models are ideal for classification and regression in labeled data sets. Things like um, spam detection, image classification, weather forecasting could have price predictions are among some of the most common applications. Compared to unsupervised learning, uh, fits perfectly for clustering and association of data points 
used for things like detection, custom behavior prediction, recommendation engines, even including um, noise removal from data sets. So yeah, supervised learning is comparatively less complex than unsupervised learning because the output is already known, making the training procedure much more straightforward. In unsupervised learning, on the other, on the other hand, we need to work with large unclassified data sets and identify the hidden patterns in the data. The output that we're looking for is not known, which makes the training harder. Okay, so I realize I've been talking for quite a while. Um, so I've just got some scenarios on the screen that I'd like you guys to think to yourselves about. And um, I'll discuss whether these scenarios are basically best suited for supervised or unsupervised learning methods. So let's have a look at some of the examples and I'll give you 30 seconds to a minute just to think about this to yourself and have a think whether a supervised or unsupervised training method would be most appropriate. So in our first scenario, we need to predict the number of vehicle purchases in a city for historical data. Do you think that we would need a supervised or an unsupervised learning method to do so? Okay, so yeah, I hope you've been able just to think about that a little bit to yourselves. Um, in this instance, it would seem that we have already labeled data set because of this historical implication. So in this instance, a supervised model might be more appropriate. Um, a further example of an algorithm that falls within the supervised learning that might be appropriate could be again, a simple linear regression. Because with simple linear regression, you can estimate that relationship between one and independent variable, uh, which could, for example, be the historical data, and then compare this to the dependent variable, which would be the number of vehicles. Uh, we'll then move on to scenario two. In this scenario, we need to identify if a potential customer in that city would purchase a vehicle given their income and community history. So again, do you think that a supervised or unsupervised learning method would be most appropriate to build a model for this situation? Again, I'll give you 30 seconds just to think independently. So initially, um, when I first read this question, I thought that this would be quite suited to a supervised, supervised learning method. And this is again, because we have a known number of classifiers in the question. We know um, that the, the known classifiers would be the income and community history, which would identify some sort of labeled data set. Um, an algorithm that might work well within the supervised learning methods could be a decision tree. So in this algorithm, a classification model is created by building a decision tree for every node of the tree is a test case for an attribute. And then each branch coming from that node is a possible value for that attribute. So you could build a decision tree to decide if that customer in that city would purchase a vehicle depending on the income and community history. And just the last scenario before we round off, we want to determine different segments of customers. And this includes gender, age, income, education, et cetera. Do you think my supervised or unsupervised learning method would be best to build a model for this scenario? So in this instance, we're presented with a, um, a little bit of a different question. And this is because we isn't quite clear if we have a labeled or unlabeled data set again. Um, but I would suppose that this would need an unsupervised learning method because we're trying to determine different groups of customers. So something like a clustering model would work well, for example. Now, as discussed, clustering is an unsupervised technique where the goal is to find natural groups of clusters in a feature space and then interpret this data. So yeah, so we could be interpreting different segments of these customers. Uh, I know that also clustering is commonly used for determining customer segments in like marketing data. So being able to determine different segments of customers helps markets teams like approach these customers in a more unique way. Uh, but yeah, that draws our conclusion to the three, the three scenarios and I've hoped they've just 
give me some time to think. Um, but that draws conclusion to this talk. Uh, I hope I've been able to teach you what a machine, le machine learning is. Um, we then talked about some of the functions of machine learning and how these works. And then we had a quick discussion about how machine learning is different to classical statistics. In the second half, we looked more uh, specifically at some of these unsupervised and supervised methods. Um, using that case study, we're then able to identify the seven steps to machine learning. 